morning and good evening. I am Kara Combs, and I'm so excited to be back with you studying God's Word. Uh, this week, we're going to be studying a large section of Scripture. We're going to finish chapter 2 of 1 Samuel and go through all of chapter 3. It's a large section, and it's um, an interesting one because we are going to cover both sobering and encouraging scriptures today. We're going to see um, a foretelling of God's sovereign plan for his covenant people through um, a prophecies of judgment on the leadership who were abusing their powers and their position um, for their own greedy and immoral lifestyles. But then it's going to be contrasted with an encouraging section as young Samuel is going to rise as a faithful servant on his way to being priest, prophet, and the last judge of Israel. So um, I usually don't do this, but I chose a theme verse for this week, and it's in 1 Samuel 2.30. We're going to get there, but I just wanted to talk about it for a minute. The Lord tells Eli, the high priest, for those who honor me, I will honor and those who despise me will be lightly esteemed. So that's going to kind of carry us through this study. But let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much that you give us a way that we can know you. Lord, thank you for the work that Jesus Christ did on the cross for us. Thank you for your word. And as we open your word, we can come to know who you are and who you desire us to be. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. I pray that the Holy Spirit would open up our eyes and our hearts to speak to us through your word, Lord, and that nothing from my mouth would come out of it that isn't from you, Lord. I pray that you would just guide and direct my thoughts and my words. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so this first section, we're going to be starting in chapter 2 of 1 Samuel, and we're going to um, continue where Haley left off. She had gone over Hannah and her amazing story, and now we're in verse 12. I'm going to read this first section. It's about Eli's sons who were abusing their authority as priests um, in regards to the animal sacrifices. So it says right there, I'm going to read 12 through 17 to start with. Now the sons of Eli were corrupt. They did not know the Lord. And the priest's custom with the people was that when any man offered a sacrifice, the priest's servant would come with a three-pronged flesh hook in his hand while the meat was boiling. Then he would thrust it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot. And the priest would take for himself all that the flesh hook brought up. So they did in Shiloh to all the Israelites who came there. Also, before they burned the fat, the priest's servant would come and say to the man who sacrificed, Give meat for roasting to the priest, for he will not take boiled meat from you, but raw. And if the man said to him, They should really burn the fat first, then you may take as much as your heart desires. He would then answer them, No, but you must give it now, and if not, I will take it by force. Therefore the sin of the young men was very great before the Lord, for the men abhorred the offering of the Lord. Okay, so this is our first section, and I forgot to mention I am reading out of the New King James Version, if you want to follow in that translation. But going back to verse 12, it said that Eli's sons were corrupt. Some of your translations say useless or worthless. And it says that they did not know the Lord. Um, and Pastor David talked about that word to know meant yada, which means they didn't have any kind of personal experience. They knew of him, but they didn't have any personal experience with him, right? And this is frightening. It's frightening that the spiritual leadership didn't know the Lord. But remember in Bible times, one did not choose to be a priest. God had selected the tribe of Levi, set them apart to be his priests. And today, obviously, people choose whether they want to go into the ministry um, to become a pastor. But it started with Aaron as our first high priest, Moses' brother, and his family line after that. But Malachi 2.7 gives us a little glimpse into what the role of the priest was supposed to be about. It says in Malachi 2.7, For the lips of a priest should preserve knowledge, and men should seek instruction from his mouth. For he is a messenger of the Lord of hosts. 
But instead, Eli's sons took advantage of their position as priests. They were bullying the people into giving them whatever their greedy hearts desired from the animals that were designated to be sacrificed for their sins. In Leviticus 7, it explains how when um, animals were offered a sacrifice, they were to burn the fat off first. And the, the smoke from the burning of the fat rose up to the Lord. It says in Leviticus 7.25, all the fat is the Lord's. This shall be a perpetual statute throughout your generations in all your dwellings. You shall eat neither fat nor blood. And then specific portions after they burn the fat, they would put it in a pot to boil and give specific portions to the priests. But Hophni and Phinehas grabbed whatever portion their three-pronged fork could take a hold of, causing the people to resent the offerings. <clears throat> it says, therefore the sin of the young men, meaning those two priests, was very great before the Lord, so that the men abhorred the offering of the Lord. Some of your translations might say they had contempt for it. They despised it. So the actual ritual that was used to cleanse Israel from their sins was causing their hearts to turn away from the Lord. And it's an important and sobering reminder that just because someone is in a position of spiritual leadership, it doesn't mean that they actually know the Lord, right? Um, Jesus warned of this in Matthew 7, 21 through 23. I'm going to turn there. You could either turn with me or just listen. It's up to you. Um, I've got lots of bookmarkers in my Bible today. Nope, that's the wrong bookmarker. Here it is. Okay, this is Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Jesus said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. This is just one of those super sobering, frightening <laughs> scriptures that we all need to like check our hearts about, right? Um... But prior to that passage, Jesus was warning the followers of um, false prophets who come in sheep's clothing, but really inside they're ravenous wolves. And that's what Hophni and Phinehas were. They were ravenous wolves. They were wearing all the appropriate priestly garments, but inside, you know, they were just satisfying their flesh, not only with the animal sacrifices, but we're going to find out later on that they were also sleeping with women outside the tabernacle. And that kind of reminds me of some of the idol worship that would happen um, with temple prostitutes. And so there was all kinds of wickedness going on. We know that true followers of the Lord are going to bear good fruit but only rotten fruit was coming from Hophni and Phinehas, right? Jesus said to his disciples, if you love me, keep my commandments. That's John 14, 15. And James 1, says, be doers of the word, not just hearers only, deceiving yourselves. I'm not saying that our salvation is based on works because we learned last year in Romans, specifically 10, 9, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. But that confession represents a turning from our sin, right? A putting off of the old man and putting on the new man. There should be evidence of our confession of faith. And with the help of the Holy Spirit, um, we should be able to lay aside the weights um, and the sin that so easily ensnares us, like it says in Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, so that we can run with endurance the race set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And this, this life is more of a marathon race, right? Not a sprint. It's, it's long. And so we really need to not be weighted down. Um, it kind of reminds me, when Dave and I were dating, 
I was in my last semester in college, and so I was working over at Bagels and Blenders, which was a new establishment at the time, and the original owner was a big runner. He ran marathons, started a running club, and he wanted to put on a little spring, kind of like a fun run, if you will. And Dave and I signed up to, to run it, and I think it was a 10K or something like that, but he had a little twist to this race because it was so close to Easter. Instead of placing Easter egg along the route, he decided to paint rocks of different colors, like pastel, springy colors. Small rocks, medium rocks, and pretty large rocks. And on these rocks, he would put different numbers, which represented times. Therefore, as you're running this race, if you wanted to pick up a rock and carry it all the way to the end, you could deduct that number from your time. So it was just kind of a fun way to um, challenge yourself, I guess. So Dave and I started our run, and we had completely different strategies. <laughs> I was just going to do my best. I was not into picking up rocks. No, thank you. I kind of wanted to just prove to my boss that I wasn't wimpy, I guess. <laughs> Dave had some confidence, and he saw a really big rock, and I think it said maybe like five minutes on it, which that's a lot of time to take off of a race. So he's like, yeah, I can do this. He picked up this rock, and, and there's nowhere to put it because it's too heavy. So he's literally running like this with this big old rock, and he's getting slower. And I decided to leave him behind because that wasn't my strategy. <laughs> and so I just kind of keep going at my pace. And as we get closer to the end, I had to turn a corner to finish the race. And I can look back and see him. And he's still holding on to this really heavy rock. And he is so, fr you can see the frustrated <laughs> look on his face. And he could have put this rock down at any time, but then you don't gain that um, time advantage, right? <laughs> so the point of all of that story was just that we do that. We do that in our walk with the Lord. We pick up weights. We pick up rocks. And we don't realize how it's slowing us down in our, in our marathon race of life, right? And I look back at my own walk with the Lord. And sometimes unknowingly, I've put weights or rocks in my pack, weights of bitterness, discontentment, envy, selfishness, these things that started to take root. And I can't figure out why I'm so tired, right? Why this race feels so long as I'm trying to walk with the Lord. Or sometimes we knowingly pick up a rock like Dave did thinking, I got this. It's not a big deal. I can handle it. And then we, and then we don't know how to put it down because it takes root. So let's go ahead and continue on in 1 Samuel. Uh, we are going to be on verse 18, and we're going to turn a corner here. We're going to read about Samuel himself. We're going to read 18 through 21. But Samuel ministered before the Lord even as a child, wearing a linen ephod. Moreover, his mother used to make him a little robe and bring it to him year by year when she came up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. And Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife and say, The Lord give you descendants from this woman for the loan that was given to the Lord. Then they would go on their way home. And the Lord visited Hannah so that she conceived and bore three sons and two daughters. Meanwhile, the child Samuel grew before the Lord. I love how this section contrasts what we just read about the wicked leadership. It says, but Samuel, right? In contrast to their, their wicked lifestyle, we see young Samuel ministering before the Lord. And Hannah's love is demonstrated in how she makes him a new robe every year. She knows that he's growing. I'm, I'm guessing it was similar <clears throat> maybe to the priestly robes. And I imagine Samuel brought a lot of hope to Eli as well. He knew his sons were out of control, and he sees this um, young boy strong in faith. And he prays for, for Hannah, and his prayer is graciously answered because she lent her son to the Lord, and she kept her vow, right? 
And we've talked about how difficult that must have been. And I love how Caleb and Haley both said that she held on to Samuel loosely and she kept her vow. Even though now finally, you know, that label of barren had been lifted and her reproach finally lifted, she still kept her vow. It was important. And many times in the Bible, it explains the importance of keeping a vow. Ecclesiastes 5.5 5 tells us it's better that you should not vow than that you should vow and not pay. How many of us in our young faith have said, oh, Lord, if you just give me, I don't know, maybe it's a husband, a baby, that job, that house, I don't know, whatever it might be. And then when we get it, we forget our end of the bargain, whatever we said we would do, (laughs) right? But Hannah didn't do that. And so the Lord richly blesses her with five more children. Okay, we're going to continue on. We are in verse 22. And now we're again, we're switching back and forth. Now Eli is going to rebuke his sons for their, for their behavior. Starting in verse 22. Now Eli was very old and he heard everything his sons did to all Israel and how they lay with the women who assembled at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. So he said to them, why do you do such things? For I hear of your evil dealings from all the people. No, my sons, it is not a good report that I hear. You make the Lord's people transgress. If one man sins against another, God will judge him. But if a man sins against the Lord, who will intercede for him? Nevertheless, they did not heed the voice of their father because the Lord desired to kill them. These are the super fun verses to teach on. (laughs) But I love that Crossroads has always been a church that hasn't shied away from teaching the hard verses. Um, So it's obvious Eli didn't agree with his son's behavior. So his rebuke was appropriate, but he should have done more. He was the high priest. He should have completely removed them from their position. And anybody who's been a parent for very long, when just telling your child or adolescent or teenager that their behavior is wrong and sinful, when that doesn't bring about the behavior change that you're hoping for, then you need to take more action, right? Whether it's consequences, taking away privileges, whatever it might be, new boundaries, that kind of thing. And with lots and lots of prayer, you know, we we hope that a heart will change. But Eli didn't do that. He just told him it was wrong. And let's be clear, all sin is against the Lord. Some is just direct and some is indirect against him. And it says they did not heed the voice of their father because the Lord desired to kill them. So Eli's warning fell on deaf ears, but God always gives an opportunity to repent But because they had persisted in their evil ways, God had determined that he was going to judge them. And this was a divine judicial hardening as a result of their refusal to repent because God's sovereign will, his plan is going to prevail. And his plan for his covenant people was not that they continued to walk in darkness, right? And that's exactly where Hophni and Phinehas were leading them. Even in James 3, 1 warns us that not many of you should be teachers, my brothers, knowing that we will receive a greater judgment. This is also a very sobering reminder and in the forefront of my mind (laughs) a lot. And it's also an important reminder to remember that we all actually deserve death. All of us have sin that separates us from God, right? It's only because of the redeeming blood of Christ that we've been declared righteous. Um, I'm going to read from Colossians 1, 21 and 22. Again, you can turn there if you'd like, or you could just follow with me. Colossians 1, 21 and 22 says, And you who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. So we went from being aliens and enemies of God to being re- reconciled because of what Jesus did on the cross, not because of our, you know, perfect living. <laughs> okay, let's continue on. First Samuel, now we're, we're going to finish chapter 2. So we're going to go from 
26 on. And the child Samuel grew in stature and in favor with both with the Lord and men. Then a man came, uh, the, a man of God, sorry, came to Eli and said to him, Thus says the Lord, Did I not clearly reveal myself to the house of your father when they were in Egypt in Pharaoh's house? Didn't I choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to offer upon my altar, to burn incense, and to wear an ephod before me? And did I not give to the house of your father all the offerings of the children of Israel made by fire? Why do you kick at my sacrifice and my offerings, which I have commanded in my dwelling place, and honor your sons more than me, to make yourselves fat with the best of all the offerings of Israel, my people? Therefore the Lord God of Israel says, I said indeed that your house and the house of your father would walk before me forever. But now the Lord says, far be it from me, for those who honor me I will honor and those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. That's my theme verse. <laughs> Keep going. Behold, the days are coming that I will cut off your arm and the arm of your father's house, so that there will not be an old man in your house, and you will see an enemy in my dwelling place, despite all the good which God does for Israel. And there shall not be an old man in your house forever. But any of your men who I do not cut off from my altar shall consume your eyes and grieve your heart, and all the descendants of your house shall die in the flower of their age. Now this shall be a sign to you that will come upon your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, in one day they shall die, both of them. Then I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who shall do according to what is in my heart and in my mind." I will build him a sure house, and he shall walk before my anointed forever. And it shall come to pass that everyone who is left in your house will come and bow down to him for a piece of silver and a morsel of bread and say, please put me in one of the priestly positions that I may eat a piece of bread. So here this unnamed prophet comes to Eli and tells him of this up upcoming judgment upon his sons that both Hophni and Phinehas are going to die on the same day. And he first he, he lists, he said, didn't I choose your family line to be my priests? And he lists three important jobs of the priests. I wanted to talk about that a little bit. Um, he said, didn't I choose you to offer upon my altar? So we know that the priests were the only ones that were able to make atonement for the sins of Israel by the blood of animals, right? to intercede for them. And then he said, to wear my linen ephod. So they had priestly garments that it says in scripture very clearly what they were to be. There was a blue robe, and then the linen ephod was kind of an apron-like piece of clothing that went over the blue robe, but it was very beautiful. It had threads of gold and scarlet and purple and blue that were interwoven. And on the shoulder straps, on each shoulder was a stone encased in gold. And each of them had six tribes of Israel written on the stones as a memorial. So they were always mindful of who they were interceding for. And it, these garments, excuse me, <clears throat> were just a, a reminder that they were consecrated. They were set apart to the Lord for this service, right? And then he said, didn't I choose you to burn incense? And it was, incense was used so differently than today. It was considered most holy. And Pastor David, even today, which is technically Sunday for me, um, that incense was the prayers of the saints rising up to the Lord. And so there was an altar of incense right in front of the Holy of Holies that was perpetually burning. And not only that, it says the smoke of the incense rose over to the um, Ark of the Covenant over the mercy seat, and it protected the high priest who went in there only that one day of year on the Day of Atonement, lest he die. And it was a very specific um, mixture of spices that God said was not to be used for personal use, and only the priests could burn it. And there's a super sobering story in Second Chronicles. I'm not going to turn there, but 
2 Chronicles 26 about King Uzziah who was growing kind of prideful and he decides to go into the temple to burn incense himself and the priests are kind of following after him like, no, no, that's not for you. You're a king, you're not a priest. But he does it anyway and as soon as he lights that, he's struck with leprosy. And so these are things that God's reminding him through this unnamed prophet, I've given you these awesome responsibilities and privileges and you're just kicking at them, right? He said, why do you kick at my sacrifice and my offering which I have commanded in my dwelling place and honor your sons more than me to make yourselves fat with the best of all the offerings of Israel, my people? So because Eli had simply warned his sons and didn't use his authority to ensure that the tabernacle was kept holy, um, a true place of worship, he was showing that he honored his sons more than the Lord. And Jesus told his followers the same thing. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. That's in Matthew 10, 37 and 38. So we too need to check our hearts and our behaviors, right? You're coming to Bible study, which is awesome. That tells me you want to know the Lord more. Praise God. But sometimes we too can place family, jobs, um, careers, hobbies, um, all those things. We can place those in a place of importance above the Lord. Or even as parents, sometimes we turn a blind eye to maybe things that our kids are listening to, watching, um, having access to, maybe how many social media platforms they have, because the pull of the culture is so strong. And sometimes we just don't want the fight, right? But our role as parents to train them up in the Lord, we're going to be held accountable for that. So These scriptures were just such a sober reminder for me. That those who honor me, he says, he will honor, right? And that verse again, where it says, um, those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Some translations say insignificant or disdained. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be lightly esteemed in God's eyes. So let's examine our lives and just see, is there areas where maybe I'm not honoring the Lord as much as I should be? So this unnamed prophet tells Eli that his sons are going to be cut off in one day. And in such a terrifying way, I can't imagine hearing that kind of news from an unnamed prophet. And then it says um, in verse, I'm rereading verse 35, Then I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who shall do according to what is in my heart and in my mind. I will build him a sure house and he shall walk before my anointed forever. Some Bible scholars um, believe that this was a reference to um, Zadok who was a high priest during King David and Solomon's reign. And he was a type of Christ, and others believe that this is actually referring to Jesus, who is our final high priest. I do know it says in Hebrews 4.14, Therefore, since we have such a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. Whether it's referring to him in 1 Samuel, I do not know. Okay, but now we're going to go ahead and see a shift from all this unrestrained um, sin from Hophni and Phinehas to Samuel's obedience and his faithfulness as a young servant of the Lord. So we're going to read all of chapter 3, and then we'll go back and and hit the highlights. Okay, so start with me in chapter 3. Now the boy Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli. And the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no widespread revelation. And it came to pass at that time, while Eli was lying down in his place, when his eyes had begun to grow dim, so dim that he could not see, and before the lamp of God went out in the tabernacle of the Lord, where the ark of God was, and while Samuel was lying down, that the Lord called Samuel. And he answered, Here I am. So he ran to Eli, and he said, Here I am, for you called me. He said, I did not call. Lie down again. And he went and laid down. Then the Lord called yet again, Samuel. 
So Samuel arose and went to Eli, and he said, Here I am, for you called me. And he answered, I did not call. My son, lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, nor was the word of the Lord yet revealed to him. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time. So he arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you did call me. I love that. He's like, I know you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord had called the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go, lie down, and it shall be, if he calls you, that you must say, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood and called as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel answered, Speak, for your servant hears. Then the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I will do something in Israel, at which both ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. In that day I will perform against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. For I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knows, because his sons made themselves vile and did not restrain them. Therefore I have sworn to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. So Samuel laid down until morning and opened the doors of the house of the Lord, and Samuel was afraid to tell Eli the vision. Then Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. He answered, Here I am. And he said, What is the word that the Lord spoke to you? Please do not hide it from me. God, do so to you and more also if you hide anything from me of all the things which he said to you. Then Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. And he said, It is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. So Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, knew that Samuel had been established as a prophet of the Lord. Then the Lord appeared again in Shiloh, and for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord. Okay, so let's back up a little bit. So it says, while morning was approaching, the lampstand and the tabernacle was about to go out. So... Um, Pastor David explained this in detail, which was great. This was kind of a literal verse and a metaphorical. So literally, they had the lamp stand perpetually burning, and the oil needed to be refilled. So it's probably getting close to that hour. But then also metaphorically, um, because Israel had been in darkness for so long and walking and doing what was right in their own eyes, um, you know, that light of truth and that light of who God was was about to go out, right? And that's what the light represented. It represented um, truth and who God was. Uh, okay. Since Samuel was not accustomed to hearing for the, from the Lord, his name is called three times, and he naturally assumes this is Eli calling him. And the thing that's interesting to me that it took Eli three times to figure it out because <laughs> obviously he hadn't been hearing from the Lord for a while either. But I love how he said that if he calls again, that you are to say, speak, Lord, for your servant hears. That's such a great reminder of the attitude of our hearts that we should have, right? As we spend time in his presence, um, like we've talked about with prayer, not just giving all our requests to God and doing all the talking, but sitting and listening, absorbing his word. Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. And this first message that Samuel's given is one of judgment on his mentor, on his spiritual teacher and father, right? How difficult and devastating that must have been for Samuel. Kind of terrifying that he's got to tell him this. And he's kind of, he's quickly put to the test to tell Eli everything that he heard. Um... I'm sure he was a bit of a witness to what was going on with Hophni and Phinehas, what they were doing. And now it's made clear by the Lord that this was completely unacceptable and sinful. And it's, a, it's so sweet to see his, even at a young age, that he was full of integrity. And he told Eli everything that the Lord shared with him. He spoke the truth. And so begins Samuel's ministry as a young uh, faithful servant of the Lord. 
And it says, everything that he proclaimed came true. So we have just so many great and sobering truths that we can apply to our lives with these two chapters, right? May we each check our hearts and be quick to confess our sins so that we're not holding on to those rocks like I was talking about in my story with Dave and I. So we can run this race, this marathon race of life, right? So that we can keep our eyes fixed on him. So we can honor him in all that we're doing. <clears throat> Sometimes it's, it's things we're holding on to unintentionally, like I have done in the past, whether it was bitterness or discontentment, or sometimes it's things that we think we, we can manage on our own. But we get tired. You end up getting tired running your race, and you're like, I, I don't know. I don't know why I'm so tired. But the Lord's saying, lay those things at my feet. He wants us to honor him in every sphere of our life, right? Whether it be in our family, whether it be in our workplace, with our friends, with our neighbors, with our freedoms to hold it all loosely the way Hannah did with Samuel. And when we come into his presence, may we say, speak, Lord, for your servant hears, right? Okay, I'm going to go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for not only the sobering reminder of what habitual sin does, especially in leadership, Lord, but just a reminder of um, having the attitude of honoring you in everything that we're doing and having hearts that want to hear you and want to walk in obedience to you, Lord. Help us not to hold on to anything that's going to um, get in the way of our walk with you, Father. Help us to, to lay those things down, to put those rocks down, and just to be able to run with endurance and, and freedom, freedom in Christ, Lord. I just lift all these things up to you in Jesus' name. Amen.